Welcome to this new webisode, the sixth of the eight aspects of a life of seeking God and His kingdom. It is the profession life. We'll see what this profession life means. The apprentice monk now makes a decision. And what is that decision all about? To give the gift of his entire self to God. To bind himself for life to God. or to use the words of Benedict in the 58th chapter of his rule, to leave no more the monastery, not to shake off his neck from the yoke of the rule. In short, the apprentice monk decides to live the entire monastic life as prescribed by the rule and as practiced in the monastery. And so he makes a declaration of this, a public declaration of this. And this is what we call monastic profession. Now what are the elements of the monastic profession? There are three elements. The first is the promise followed by the petition and ends with the prayer. The promise is an oath or a vow made in the presence of God and all his saints who are invited as witnesses. That's why the litany of all the saints is prayed during the monastic profession. So the, the vow or the oath is made to God in the presence of the whole heavenly court whose members are invited to witness the public declaration of the monk to live the monastic life as is prescribed by the rule and as is observed or live in the monastery. The oath is a vow. It's not just a mere promise, but it's a vow, a sacred vow, which is also made to a human being, namely the abbot. So it's made to God and to the abbot. And since the abbot is believed to take the place of Christ in the monastery, the promise, the oath, the vow made to the abbot is in effect made to Christ. So that's the promise. It's a very sacred thing. It's a sacred vow. It's a sacred oath. Now, what follows after this uh, promise, uh, the petition? The petition is a written document in which the apprentice monk states 
the terms of his promise, namely, the donation of his entire self to God, his free gift of self, whole and entire to God. And he places the petition or written document on the altar which symbolizes the voluntary and uh, free self-offering of himself to God, whose presence is uh, represented by the altar. So, of course, you cannot see God there, but the altar on which the document is uh, laid the written, the written document is lay, laid. The altar symbolizes the presence of God. After the profession, right? So the, the profession is a right, is a ritual. After the profession, right? The abbot takes the petition from the altar. And this is an act symbolizing the reality that the monk who has given himself totally has no more control over himself. So the double takes the document. So it symbolizes the, uh, the double takes hold, takes control of the monk who is no longer uh, who has no more control over himself. And this petition is kept in the archives of the monastery. That even if the monk, which God forbid, leaves the monastery, it is not returned to him, but serves as a witness against his apostasy. So the living of the monk of the monastery is uh, likened to an apostasy. So that's the petition. Then the petition is followed by a prayer. The apprentice monk addresses himself to God in the words of Psalm 118. Receive me, O Lord, as you have promised, and I shall live. Do not disappoint my hope. And this prayer expresses the give of self of the monk and ask God that it may be acceptable and that God may respond to it by fulfilling the hope of the monk. Uh, in Christ of the Desert, the following prayer entitled Oblation is used instead of 118, Psalm 118. And uh, the words are beautiful. Let me recite them to you. Here is my body, a broken vessel. Take its pieces, put them together to form the mosaic of a life colored by your rainbow, lighted by your sunbeams, vibrant with your life, O Lord. So here is my body, the oblation of the body. And the second part of the prayer here is my person, 
person. The deepest roots, the core, the ground, the heart of my being, loving, willing, thinking. Seal it with yourself, with your heart, with your thoughts, your own forever, O oh Lord. So here is my person. Here is my body person offered in holocaust, in oblation, in communion at love's altar. Father, receive me, transform me into your child, a little one of your kingdom. Well, I, I composed a prayer and my friend who is a UP Conservatory of Music pre-war set it into music. On the day of my perpetual profession, I sang that prayer. It's a beautiful prayer and also a beautiful song. I wish there were an organist here to accompany the song and I would sing it for you. When I sang that oblation, uh, I stood uh, in front of uh, Monsignor Venancio Acas, the Vicar General, who received my vows <coughs> in the absence of then Bishop Patricio Lopez, who was the de Delegatus ad Omnia of the Archdiocese of Nueva Segovia, was by that time Archbishop Sanchez was already in Rome. So I stood and with like the with my palms hands up in the manner of the UP Statue of Oblation and raising my head up, I sang the song. So that's the, those are the elements of the monastic profession. We have the promise, which is a vow, an oath made to God, but made also to the abbot. But since the abbot takes the place of Christ in the monastery, in effect it is made to Christ. And then there is the written document, a petition, in which the monk expresses formally the terms of the, his promise, the donation of himself whole and entire to God. And he places the document on the altar, the altar symbolizing the presence of God to whom the oblation is made. And after the rite, the abbot takes the written document, which symbolizes that from now on, the monk who had made his profession has no longer control over his life. And this petition is kept in the archives of the monastery. And then the prayer, which is a prayer of hope. And it asks God that the gift of self may, may be acceptable and that God may not disappoint the monk, but may respond to his prayer by fulfilling the hope of the monk. Now let's take a look at the content of the profession. In the Benedictine 
profession, the content is fivefold. First is stability. Second, conversion of life. Third, obedience. Fourth, <clears throat> uh, celibate chastity and faith, evangelical poverty. Let's uh, explain a little bit these five uh, contents of the profession of the monk, stability. It's uh, very encouraging to note that my uh, conference on stability is getting to the number one of those topics that you love to listen to. Another word for stability is perseverance. And perseverance entails patience. Patience in its turn entails sufferings. This uh, stability, perseverance, patience, suffering entails stability of place, actual physical presence in the cenobium or the cloister of the monastery. It entails further stability of heart, accepting the doctrina, that is, observing Christ's teaching in the monastery until death, and conforming one's behavior to it. And Christ's teachings are found summarized in the rule and in the teachings of the abbot of the monastery. Stability further entails stability in the community. So it's not just in a place, you know, but in the community of monks. Observing poverty, silence, humility. and then joining in the daily round of prayer and work. Persevering above all in obedience, which is the primary characteristic of, its, of the community, of the Cenobitic community. Stability, however, does not go against the passage to the eremitical life. The cenobium in principle, the monastic community in principle, is the apprenticeship for the desert. In fact, uh, even the cistercians of the stricter observance Uh, give uh, room for such a passage to the eremitical life. There are now uh, Cistercian hermits. So that's stability. 
The second is the conversatio morum, the conversion of life. Well, the way of life referred to is the monastic way of life. And the apprentice monk or the monk who makes a vow commits himself to follow the way of life observed in the must monastery with all that it entails. Conversion of conduct, conversion of moral life, But above all, the monastic life as lived in the monastery is a life under the rule, the rule of St. Benedict, and under an abbot in a particular community or monastery. In practice, the conversion of life entails that tomorrow, Friday will not find me the same as today, Thursday. There must at least be some kind of, of a change, a transformation of my way of life, of my behavior patterns, etc. Then the third uh, content of the profession is obedience. Life in the monastery is one of obedience, determined by the traditional observances laid down by the rule and by the teaching directives of the abbot. And these observances apply the gospel and the rule in the details of everyday life. The monk is to live the monk is to live out this obedience in the context of his own cenobium. Persevering in obedience in the same place and with the same community, with the same brothers following its observances. And the promise of obedience is binding for life. Again, let me recall what the two kinds of obedience we talk about in one of the presentations. The educative obedience may cease as soon as the monk has attained maturity, enough maturity. But the ascetical obedience is a lifetime obedience, namely the discipline of the ego, the discipline of the promptings and inclinations of the self unredeemed by grace. And this is for a lifetime. So that's uh, the third content of the profession. The fourth is uh, celibate chastity. It's virginity or celibacy. What is virginity or celibacy? It is perfect and perpetual continence for the love of the kingdom of God. Perfect and perpetual continence for the love of the kingdom of God. Well, you see the adjectives perfect and perpetual are scaring enough. But such perfect and perpetual continence is possible with the grace of God.
why does a monk give himself to this perfect and perpetual continence while to devote himself to God alone and with an undivided heart. By the way, celibate chastity entails two things. First, human sexuality live as a genuine sign of and precious service to the love of communion and the gift of self to others. And second, it entails renunciation of marriage the nuptial meaning of the body as a personal gift to Jesus Christ and to his church seen from this twofold vantage point chastity is a prefiguration and anticipation of the perfect and final self-giving of the world to come so it has both an incarnational and eschatological uh, value. And the fifth is evangelical poverty. Note, I'm using the adjective evangelical. It's not poverty alone, but evangelical poverty. Evangelical poverty is the subjection of all goods to the supreme good that is God and his kingdom. Contemplating on the mystery of God as the one and supreme good and as a definitive treasure, a monk sees the loving and responsible use of all goods. So, the loving and responsible use of all goods and at the same time renounces them with reference to God and his plan. This is not just the loving and uh, responsible use of all goods but uh, the renunciation too of these goods with reference to God and to his plan. A truly poor monastic community is a specific sign of separation from this avowal of and non-submission to the tyranny of the contemporary world which puts its trust in money and in material security. So those are the contents of the, the five contents of the uh, vows or the profession of the monk. Now let's uh, recall again here what we have uh, said before in one uh, presentation concerning the concerning the implications or the challenges of this vow. By the way, this uh, five vows of the monk are based on virtues. So you, I don't think you lay people will make vows like the vows of the monk. But since these vows postulate a life of virtues, so the vows of the monk in their implications in your life would call for a life of virtues. 
Uh, for instance, when a believer is raised to the altar or is a canonized saint, the life of his life of heroic virtues is investigated very carefully because to be declared a saint of the Catholic Church is to have lived a life of heroic virtues while he or she was living on earth. Well, we have one Ilocano believer, the late uh, Bishop Alfredo Florentin Versosa. His uh, cause for uh, beatification, canonization at the diocesan level has been already made and all the needed papers were forwarded to Rome which gave the mark of validity that valid. Yet we are now waiting for the next step of the process. Bishop Alfredo Florentin Versosa live a life of heroic virtues. The most heroic virtue that he lived out is obedience. He was told by Rome to resign as the Bishop of Lipa without explaining the reason why. And without much ado, he packed his things and went home to vegan. Of course, we who do not know the story of the forced resignation, we suspect that uh, it was due to the false miracle of the shower of roses at the Carmel of Lipa City. But he never said anything about this uh, forced resignation. He never uttered a word of complaint. He was suffering it in his heart. And he lived a life of seclusion in their house in Vigan. No word of complaint. Evangelical obedience, but it's based on his virtue of obedience. Other things like his virtues, Oh, evangelical poverty. He went home to vegan with no money. And uh, he did not even have anything to offer to his sisters who were serving him in his life of uh, seclusion. Heroic indeed, right? So for most of us, our lot will not be to be canonized as saints. Besides, uh, the process of canonization is very expensive. For instance, uh, Bishop Versosa wrote so many pastoral letters and very ascetic and uh, mystical. But he wrote them all in Spanish. And uh, for the process of canonization, they have to be translated into English. Oh, it's a long, long table on which his pastoral letter letters were placed and they had to uh, employ the services of a translator from Spanish to English. And the translator was charging 1,000 pesos per page. Oh, very expensive. So for most of us, our lot will not be the lot of canonized saints. But just the same as 
disciples of Jesus and as members of the community of disciples, which is the church, we will have to live a life of virtues. Not on the heroic level, as the canonized saints did, but on the level of plain virtues. And so the implication, therefore, of the profession of the vows of uh, stability, conversion of life, obedience, celibate chastity, and evangelical poverty. We will have to start to live out the human virtues, especially the four cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. And we move to the plane of the, we move over to the plane of the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. And finally, we have to take into account the living out of, verse, of these virtues by our own particular state of life. So that would be the challenge of the, the virtues which form the basis of the vows uh, of the monk. Oh. Again, was the challenge of evangelical poverty. As we said before, evangelical poverty is not slovenliness in appearance, in clothing, and in person. A believer should be neat and clean but without the uh, modern age designed by the market to appear neat and clean. Poverty is not economical, economic shrewdness. The preoccupation with financial matters and with the ways and means to have and to save money in the name of self-support, subsistence, and in any eventuality in the future. Poverty is understood as evangelical in the sense of following of Christ, the following of the poor Christ, and the living his life of poverty in view of the kingdom. Then again, as we said, uh, evangelical poverty has a prophetic significance. Namely, it is a sign of separation from, separation from, or disavowal of and non-submission to the tyranny of a contemporary world who has put all its trust in money and in financial security. So that's the, that's the challenge. And for you lay people who had been blessed by God with material blessings, you have to use your material blessings to win the kingdom of God and to help others who are in need. For instance, in the marriage encounter weekend seminar, the couples talking about the evangelical councils talk about how they can use material things, money, etc in order to 
be of service to the spread of the kingdom. What's the challenge of chastity? Celebrate chastity. Well, love today is equated to sex. Sex is the eros of the Greek culture. E-R-O-S, eros. Which is sensual, instinctual. Sometimes love is equated to friendship, the philia of the Greek culture, which is a give and take process. On this level, love as friendship is still selfish. On a deeper level, love means storche, the familial, intimate and personal relationship of the immediate members of the family. In some ways, all these three nuances of love are selfish. The agape, A-G-A-P-E, the agape meaning of love is selflessness and selfishness and the total gift of self. This is the correct meaning of love. It is called charity. So, the challenge of celibate or virginal chastity is the challenge of our understanding, proper understanding, correct understanding of the meaning of love. Chastity entails the gift of self under the influence of charity or selflessness. A challenge of chastity today is a challenge of selflessness ordained towards the gift of self to God and to others. And connected with the challenge of the gift of self is the challenge of the integration of the person keeping the integrity of all the powers of life and love place in him, biological, affective, spiritual, intellectual, and so on. Another challenge of chastity today is the challenge of self-mastery. self-control, putting the appetites and uh, passions of the senses under the control of reason and under the impulse of faith. So those are the challenges of the monk's vow of celibate or virginal chastity. Again, what would be the challenges of obedience today? The children of yesteryears were breastfed. Today they are now fed with milk of cows and goats. No wonder, as the common joke goes, the children of today have grown horns on their foreheads. It is a way of saying that they are very disobedient, 
has and is called teacher to confirm or deny the truth of this assertion. The problem of obedience lies with the ego. Spiritual masters call it self-will. The ego or the self-will must be disciplined, trained, and made to bend under a tutor's sway. Oh, well, we find this disobedience almost everywhere. Parents, teachers, and authorities have also become permissive and lax as to fear the disciplining of the ego and the self-will of the now generation. It is no wonder that people of today take so lightly the commandments of God and the commandments of the church. If ever they take them into account. So we are confronted today with all problems of obedience. The conversion of life what is the challenge uh, for us today? It seems to be a mark of modern man to choose what he likes and to disregard what he does not like. It is a kind of a selective admission dictated by his sense of likes and dislikes. Today we talk about the holistic approach, whole, A-W-H-O-L-E. It is equivalent to the package deal. We accept even the things in the package that we would rather not want to have. And this kind of holistic approach, W-H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C, leads us to the holistic approach, H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C, holy. That is to say, it can help us become holy. And this is the challenge of the conversion of life, the conversion of the way of life. Our morals are not the only ones maintained on the plane of holiness, but even our ways of doing things, they should be raised to the level of holiness. Yeah, this young cure, I remember, I recall what Saint the rest of the child Jesus uh, said, if you pick up a pin that fell on the floor, you know, what's that? Picking up a pin that fell on the floor. You pick it up. But if you pick it up and you do it for the missions, or for some missionaries working in mission lands, for the love of the missions and for the love of God, you can convert a soul. Now the, the last of the, the vows of uh, the monk is stability. I deliberately put it as the last in this presentation. 
because as I said, as we have been monitoring you, uh, the presentation of stability has come up to number one that you like best to listen to and you return to it again and again. Today, there is uh, instability of everything. Today, there is fear to make permanent connections, permanent uh, commitments, rather, either in marriage or in the religious priestly life. Oh, well, you have all kinds of uh, uh, practices now related to marriage, live in unions, and the worst, we have now same-sex same marriages. Not to mention, of course, the divorces and, and the annulments and so on. Years back, there was even a bill introduced uh, to the Congress, the bill of absolute divorce with right to remarry. And unfortunately, this was uh, authored by an Ilocano congressman. And even the church seems to have been infected by this kind of, you know, fear to make permanent commitments. In Amoris Laetitia, the church seems to advocate that those who were married in the church and have separated and have live again with uh, other, another uh, partner, that they may now be allowed to receive Holy Communion. Mm. And it has scandalized so many believers, and it has shaken the faith of so many Catholic believers all over the world. In the priestly life, oh, so many have left. Although the doctrine says that a priest is a priest forever, because in the soul of the priest, there is marked the priestly seal. But, well, he has to be uh, sort of controlled or deprived of the practices of the priestly ministry for one reason or the other. Religious sisters, oh, they're living by the thousands. Today there is also the abhorrence of routine. And today's world is noted for its characteristic of or change, rapid, constant, ongoing. There is an urge of postmodern men and women for novelties and uh, variations in fashion in hairdo, in music, in lifestyle, in food and drinks, jobs and employment, variation, change of even language. You listen to the young people, you listen to the language of the young people, it's totally new. So there is also a growing impatience 
for the state of affairs of families. Yeah, for instance, uh, there was a father of a family, or anyhow, father of a boy because uh, he has only one child. They are living together. Uh, the wife, the mother of the boy, is working abroad as a nurse. And since uh, the boy was born, the mother went abroad to work. And, uh, well, you know, the boy treats his father as a uh, body body and has brought that body body culture to school. And in the school, it's a private Catholic school. He treats the teachers as body bodies. And one time, the principal of the high school department went to act as a substitute of a teacher who was sick. And the boy was treating sister principal as body body. I said, no, no, this cannot be. See? We well, the state of affairs of schools today with the COVID-19. The lessons have to be continued online how about those who have no internet? Well, last April or early May, there were no graduations because of the quarantine and lockdown policy of the national government. Oh, everything now seems to be unstable. Now, when will the classes open? Some say August 24, others say December. Oh, everything now is unstable. The state of affairs of nations, oh, it's worse. Social institutions, the same. And, and even the state of affairs of the church life, the same. For instance, here in Nueva Segovia, there were the ordinances of the Nueva Segovia Pastoral Assembly one. When an archbishop, another archbishop came in, there were changes, and another one came in, another changes, and now changes and changes until maybe no more ordinances to follow. So, there is the growing impatience of the state of affairs of families, schools, nations, social institutions, and even church life itself. And this impatience affects the inner man, shaking him, making him unstable and inconstant. Again, the, for us Filipinos, the Nigas Kogun, our culture, the impetuosity to begin uh, new projects and drop things down somewhere at the middle. The inertia to settle down for the minimum and to be contented with it. The lack of creativity to begin new ventures. All this and similar others constitute the challenge of the stability we talk about. May this presentation of the profession of the monastic vows of the monk help you come to your realization of your own state, in your own uh, state of life. marked by the life of virtues and by the life of certain promises you have made in your life, in baptism, in marriage, in ordination, in religious consecration or perpetual vows, 
for the religious. In whatever state in life we have, may we come to that fidelity of keeping our promises to God, especially when we made them in the context of our faith. The time is up now. Thank you again for listening. And I will see you tomorrow at the same time for the next webisode on the uh, seeking God and His kingdom in the context of the rule of St. Benedict. Goodbye now. <laughs>